I'm going to start off today by just saying a few words about the CSCG Foundation. Um, they're the, the group that is uh, supporting my, uh, my tour across Canada. Um, so the, the foundation itself is an arm of the uh, Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists, which started in 2006, as you can see from the, from the slide. And uh, its uh, main, main purpose is to, uh, um, one, of the, uh, one of its uh, main things it does is has, has a scholarship program, which um, a total of $40,000 distributed in, over um, in 20 pieces to uh, various geophysics students each year, and just distributed widely across Canada. Uh, and of course, another thing it does is uh, support the lecture tour. Uh, which has been going on for 10 years, been supporting both industry people and academic experts each year. And so in addition to those events, there's uh, travel grants uh, for students to go to, uh, to go to field trips or conferences, which can be applied for. There's, a, there's an outreach program, not only to uh, universities, but also to, uh, to high schools within Canada. I would like to welcome Dr. Peter Carey to give his, uh, his uh, distinguished lecture talk today. Uh, known, knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns in land exploration seismology. Welcome, Peter. Okay, thanks uh, very much for the, for the introduction again. Um, so as you, you may have uh, read in my bio, I, uh, I did a, a a few degrees at U of T, and one of them was was in philosophy. So I, I did some wanderings, and um, there's a bit of evidence of that in, in my talk here, perhaps even in the title itself. Um, so as I as I've gotten older, I think I've perhaps gotten more interested, more and more interested in, in how people think, and not just what they're thinking about. Um, so you'll perhaps be able to understand that a little bit more by the time we're we're into the talk. So. Um, those of you who were watching the news back in 2002 will probably have remembered this infamous uh, quotation from Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense under George Bush at the time. Um, and uh, after a few moments uh, and reflection, you might be able to absorb what he's getting at here. Um, it's certainly an excessive use of the word to know, and I think uh, most of us really chuckled when we first heard this this statement. It was. Uh, it was seemed to be such obvious political doublespeak, you know. And uh, of course, what he was really getting at was the fact that he uh, was looking for excuses for invading Iraq based on the evidence of um, so-called evidence for weapons of mass destruction within Iraq. And of course, he was basing his uh, conclusions on some pretty sketchy data, probably a lot of noisy um, satellite imagery that uh, kind of resembled in a way some geophysical data that we have to deal with and probably a lot of contradictory maybe evidence uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the ground uh, about intelligence. And uh, so after I uh, reread this and finally understood what he was getting out of it, it, it unfortunately it kind of reminded me a bit of what we do in geophysics because, you know, in a way we, uh, we never have direct access to the answer that we want. We're always trying to build up this image of the subsurface without any kind of direct access to that information. But we have this noisy, sometimes contradictory um, remote sensing methods like seismic, gravity mag, etc., um, that we use to uh, to build up these um, build up these images and draw conclusions from them. And unfortunately, sometimes we do allow certain biases to influence our our conclusions about what we think is in the data, and we often have ideas about what we want to see before we see it there in the data. So that was, you know, just one instance where, you know, I didn't really want to compare geophysicists to politicians, maybe especially not Donald Rumsfeld, but nonetheless, it was there. Um, and it was actually not the first time in my career I'd been reminded of this, um, some kind of relation between geophysics and, and politics in a way. Um, Soon after I got out of grad school and got to Calgary into the uh, seismic processing business, which I've basically been involved in for the last 25 to 30 years now, 
I, I worked on this topic of surface consistent deconvolution here. Um, so back in 1993, along with Gary Lorentz, I, I published this paper um, with this algorithm, which uh, helped to speed up the process of surface consistent deconvolution quite a bit. And um, I was pretty young and naive at the time, maybe even more naive than I am now. So I thought I was I was uh, doing something really useful. But to my uh, to my um, um, unfortunate um, findings, I soon realized that I'd wandered right into the middle of a of a heated debate that was already taking on, uh, taking place about the, uh, the the effect of noise on the phase of a seismic wave. Which, now, this is a fairly obscure topic uh, to many of you, especially if you haven't worked in, in seismic processing at all. So I'll, I'll go. To, I'll try to explain what I'm talking about. But essentially, the uh, the issue was that um, there was this people on either side of this so-called political decon phase spectrum, as I, as I called it, um, who were um, strongly uh, at opposition about what the phase of the wavelet was after deconvolution. Some, basically, some people like uh, Anton Ziakovsky here uh, on the left um, strongly, um, strongly argued that the phase was completely unreliable after deconvolution. In fact, he he wrote his entire PhD thesis at, at uh, Cambridge, um, arguing that this statistical approach to decon that we still use for land data was generating um, highly variable and uncontrollable changes in the wavelet from trace to trace. And then um, on the other end of the spectrum, on the other hand, there were other uh, well-known experts like Guillaume Cambois, um, perhaps Roy White at the Imperial College, who had more, more uh, optimistic statements to make about it. Um, so in short, I mean, these were all highly educated, very intelligent people whom I admired very much, and uh, yet they were a complete opposition on this question. So in a way, it was, again, a bit like politics. And, and part of the reason for this debate even existing is because there was no accepted known method for actually measuring the phase reliably after deconvolution. Um, so that's uh, basically going to be the, the main topic of, of this talk here. So I was kind of taken aback by the, the very heated aspects of, of some of this um, some of this debate. I mean, it's it's good to be um, good to be enthusiastic and passionate about the topic of your, of your study, but it, it's probably you know unhealthy to be foaming at the mouth with your enthusiasm. And uh, there were there certainly heated arguments that were taking place at the time, and especially after graduating from places like U of T, I thought that, uh, you know, we as scientists, just like Spock, we're always uh, very emotionally calm about things and high in intellect. And uh, so, you know, when there's, when there's a question, you know, something in dispute, you go out and conduct the experiment, gather the data and interpret it, and, and that kind of settles it. So that's what I thought it might be like, but in fact, it's not like that at all. And, by the way, don't don't you think Spock looks a lot like Dick Bailey? <laughs> <laughs> he has hair. <laughs> right, the late and great Leonard Nimoy. Um, the younger people in the audience might uh, relate a little bit more with Sheldon here from Big Bang Theory. Um, perhaps, certainly a, a tinge more arrogant than Spock ever was, which which was a bit unfortunate that still exists and sometimes. Uh, adds to some of the bias in the interpretation of the results. So I'm going to start off very basically saying some you know, basic statements about what we do as seismologists in, in the uh, exploration business and uh, try to explain this issue of seismic wavelet phase. And then I'm going to kind of quickly take off from there into, uh, into more results. Um, so um, in, in industry, we especially on land data, we use uh, predominantly two different seismic sources, as I depicted up at the top here, either dynamite blasts from uh, shallow uh, drilled holes, maybe um, 5, 10, 15 meters deep, um, or else vibrosized trucks which uh, shake at the surface um, and uh, are used near cultural features and are less destructive than, than dynamite. Uh, in Canada, in the north, we especially tend to use more dynamite than, than vibrosize because it tends to be operationally much more easy to use. Um, so 
we set off many of these blasts. Uh, I've depicted just one in this photograph here. Um, of course, this is a photograph of the Grand Canyon, and we would never, ever um, conduct a seismic experiment in the Grand Canyon because we are, of course, the environmentalists. Um, so, but it's it's a good picture to use to uh, to depict what uh, what happens to the seismic waves at each interface, as you can see in the side cut here from each interface uh, where there's a impedance um, increase or decrease, um, you get a reflection where part of the energy comes back to the surface from each of these rays. And we sit up at the surface and listen um, with our geophones. And so there'll be uh, hundreds, typically thousands or tens of thousands of geophones strewn around on the surface. And we'll have, uh, say, tens of thousands of, of shots that go into each one of these 3D seismic surveys on land. So the, uh, the basic situation that we have is depicted on the right side of the slide here. We have a, we have a seismic source, sort of like a pebble dropping into a, into a pond. Um, we, uh, that generates a ripple, um, which is the, seism the, uh, the seismic source. And you know, it's oscillatory. We don't ever really know exactly what that looks like. We just uh, typically assume that it's a minimum phase wavelet, so it's front end loaded. Uh, but it can be different amplitudes um, and uh, very different frequency content, even from one place to another within the within the seismic survey. And that uh, is interacts with this so-called reflectivity sequence, as is depicted here. So from each uh, reflection, you get a part of the, the uh, part of the wave reflecting at a certain time uh, with a certain amplitude. So that seismic wavelet which is the low frequency blurring function, convolves with this reflectivity function to give this whole set of seismic traces um, depicted down in the bottom right here. And there's, of course, typically millions of these traces um, within, each, um, within each seismic survey. And uh, of course, the reflectivity changes and the seismic source changes. So it's, it's a typical inverse problem where we, for each trace, we have um, that one observable and we have two unknowns. Uh, we want to deconvolve the effect of the source wavelet. We don't know exactly what the source wavelet is, and we don't know what the um, what the reflectivity sequence is either. So it's typical, one known, two unknowns. But we make simplifying assumptions in order to go forward. So this deconvolution process is the deblurring process that I depicted on the right hand side. What happens, say, with a typical image under a microscope, if you um, deconvolve the blurring function, um, you increase the, uh, the resolution of the image. And on seismic data, as I've depicted from this one shot gather on the left, before and after deconvolution, you can see that it um, broadens the frequency range and uh, sharpens up the image of each one of these hyperbolic events, which we're using um, in order to build up the image of the subsurface. So on land data, we typically have a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, noise um, interacting with the, uh, the signal than we would ever um, record on, on the marine situation, for example. Um, so we have a lot of ground roll here on the near offsets. You can see some, um, some ground roll backscattering within this noise cone. Um, at the uh, shallower times, you can see some first arrival information and trapped energy within the, the near surface layers. So this tends to uh, confound and, and, and make the deconvolution process um, more difficult than it otherwise would be. So this um, slide il illustrates how we try to improve resolution with decon. Another function of deconvolution is to try to produce a zero phase wavelet. So we, as I mentioned earlier, we assume there's a minimum phase input wavelet from our dynamite blast um, that's convolved as well with the uh, impulse response at the receiver end of the geophone. And uh, we try to shape that back to this perfect symmetric zero phase wavelet on the right. And uh, this is um, just as equally important uh, a function of deconvolution as the, uh, as the resolution improvement is. So, the effect of noise on deconvolution is to make things overall worse, um, less than ideal. I think most, um, most geophysicists are aware that 
the effect of noise on the resolution improvement is to is to re reduce the amount of um, uh, resolution that you can possibly get. So instead of getting this high frequency uh, wavelet on the left, um, the effect of the noise is to produce a lower resolution, more ringing wavelet, as you see on the right. Um, the effect on phase as, uh, is not as well known by everyone, but it certainly has an important effect as well. So instead of getting this uh, zero phase symmetric wavelet out, um, especially the effect of low frequency noise is to twist the phase of the wavelet. So this wavelet on the, in the bottom right hand corner would be um, probably about a 45 degree phase rotated version of the wavelet on the left. And this phase rotation tends, ends up being uh, important um, when it comes to getting details out of the interpretation of, of the data. So this effect of noise, especially on the low frequency end of the spectrum, has been known for a long time by the people who really know what's going on like, uh, with deconvolution like Perkow. So as you can see in this slide, um, the ideal zero phase result is only obtained when you have zero noise. So you can get that in the computer if you synthetic seismograms, but once you start deconvolving real data, you get some amount of phase rotation because your data is always contaminated uh, on the low end with some amount of, of noise. So as there's more and more noise added, the phase, of the, the phase of the wavelet is rotated more and more so that, say, at the bottom, you actually get a polarity reversed, 180 degree um, wavelet. So in, in order to pinpoint exact location and, and waveform changes in the image, we need to be have better, need to have good control out of, uh, of the phase coming out of deconvolution. But that just does not happen. Um, we don't have good control of the phase. Um, unfortunately, this low frequency end where this low, low uh, frequency ground roll as a, shown here on the right, the left hand side, um, it's, it's always there. And that um, there's not an awful lot of low frequencies in the signal source wavelet itself. So that the uh, signal to noise ratio is actually about the worst that it is. Uh, at that low frequency range, and that's the range that determines the phase of the output. So to illustrate the effect of, of this low frequency noise on the final image that you can get, I took this simple example. It's a, uh, a 2D seismic line from Saskatchewan, good quality data. You can see nice clean reflections in here, relatively clean for land data. And I treated the noise four different ways, um, and that was the only thing that I changed in the processing stream. So. On the left-hand side, I basically did nothing. I, I included all that noise within the deconvolution design um, that was performed. Um, in the second case, I did this so-called FK filter to try to eliminate some of that. And it obviously didn't do a very good job. There's a lot of, low, lot of low frequency blobs still left in there. Um, so to try to do better than that, we could try to zero out or mute out all of that low frequency noise on the inside offsets. Or we could try to do both, both the FK filtering and the, and the muting. So as I say, that was the only thing I changed about these different, these different processing streams. Everything else was the same. And I went through to the final migrated stack image. Um, and I've shown that here on this slide. So as I said, it was from Saskatchewan. Geology in Saskatchewan is simple. It's flat. Railroad track, as you can see here. Um, so you might at first appearance, say that all these are, are virtually identical. Um, they're, they're, vers they're certainly similar, but when interpreters come to look at this and try to um, focus in on their, zo their zone of interest, they wouldn't look at this big picture of a couple of seconds, two or three seconds of data. They would zoom in on just a very limited part of this, of this uh, seismic, seismic image. So, for example, suppose their zone of interest is the Bakken shale. Um, fairly deep in the section, and let's just pretend it, uh, it tes does tend to show up as a doublet. So it might be this sort of pair of reflections close together with uh, weak amplitude, weak positive amplitude in this section on the right. And they will typically um, uh, drill horizontal wells through that, and they'll uh, need to interpret the amplitudes and the waveforms in that final image uh, very precisely in order to 
to know whether they're going in or out of that very thin shale layer. So if you look at that, um, that doublet in this section on the right compared to the other sections, you see that it's, it's really completely different. So the point here is you know, the geology hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is how, it's, how the data was processed, and yet we've uh, produced a, a very different looking image at that zone of interest because of this inability to control the phase of the wavelet. So before the interpretation takes place, they need to know um, what the actual phase of the embedded wavelet is. So they'll um, go through a process of matching um, different wavelets and in order to determine the, uh, you know, whether if there's an, a reflection coefficient increase at a particular um, depth, does it correspond to a peak or a trough or a zero crossing or, or whatnot. So we go through the simple process of going to a well. Um, hopefully it has been a well drilled at one location, at least one location in the survey. And uh, at that well you have so at least the, uh, the ground truth, so you use the velocities and densities to uh, generate a synthetic seismogram with a known embedded wavelet of zero phase, as shown by this wavelet here. And then at that well location you take the surface seismic uh, at that particular location, say the red trace, and you basically phase rotate the surface seismic with perhaps 30 degree phase rotations and get the best fit of the red trace to the blue trace. So it's a very simple operation that we've been doing for decades, um, often just taken for granted that it needs to be uh, done as a first step in interpretation. Um, I've always considered this step a bit, um, a bit of an embarrassment as a, as a processor um, by the fact that we are forced to be able to do it. We, when, when we're delivering a, a final product to the interpreters, we are not able to know what the phase is. Um, but nevertheless, people are happy generally as long as they can know that they can get back to zero phase with this constant phase rotation. They assume a constant phase rotation is good enough. Um, and if typically if you're within say 20, 30 degrees, they're happy. Um, sometimes you have more than one well within a, in a survey and hopefully they're all fairly close to the same uh, phase. Uh, not always though, and so that's a bit worrying. Um, in terms of known knowns, then what I've illustrated is, is that these simple differences in processing flows using exactly the same software, um, using the same processor, you can generate these different phases of the wavelet. So that's, that's known, but as I say, it's not too much of a worry, especially if you can believe that there is a, a lateral consistency in the phase. So, um, spatially around the survey, there is one constant phase that will we'll get you back to that um, answer. But do we really know whether there's a phase rotation happening, or have we ever really known? Well, that's the source of this heated debate that's taking place that I, I've referred to, because we haven't actually had a method um, that is um, really reliable for, for measuring these, these phase variations. And it's not for lack of effort. Um, it has been work on estimating the, the, the seismic uh, wavelet uh, phase using so-called surface consistent techniques, but the conventional wisdom is that none of them really work. And the problem is, seems to have been that phase is just too sensitive to noise, it's just too difficult a quantity to, to measure reliably. So as I say, there was a lot of um, work, as I've uh, listed here in this slide, by early workers uh, Terry Tanner and others, uh, Ronan and Claire Boat, et cetera, before the turn of the century. Um, this was all work that was done sort of before the invention of the internet and before a lot of 3D seismic was done. And uh, these are the kind of images um, uh, in the SEG presentations that are, are actually included here. And there's certainly nothing in these images that would convince you that, you know, the, the uh, the images after phase correction are in any way any better than, than before. So as I say, that's the conventional wisdom that none of these is really working and uh, the, the noise makes it too hard to estimate. Um, by the end of the talk, I hope to convince you that that's really no longer true. This is a bit of a myth that that's happened and um, perhaps um, our relook at this information, at, at these methods, um, has been warranted. So 
everything I've said up to now is referred to statistical deconvolution performed on land data. Um, I just want to include a couple of slides on the marine situation because it is completely different in, in many ways. Um, marine data is acquired over, of course, uh, a uniform velocity um, water layer, and that does a lot to be, be able to make the source and receiver um, responses much more consistent and predictable. And so uh, the data quality tends to be a whole lot better. Uh, in land data, we have this near surface, very heterogeneous layer, uh, especially in, in Canada. It's usually uh, highly glaciated, uh, a great noise generator, and uh, um, a, a great deal of our dif difficulties originates from that very first, um, say, 10 or 20 meters in the near surface. But on the marine side, um, even though they, uh, they used to do deconvolution using statistical deconvolution, um, about 20 years ago, they had this big uh, seismic shift, so to speak, in how they did their wavelet processing. So um, they basically got fed up with the, uh, the problems from phase, um, from the statistical approaches. And they use this method where they go out and uh, use uh, clean reflections from the, uh, the ocean bottom. And they'll average many hundreds or thousands of those traces together and get as high quality uh, a single wavelet estimate for the wavelet, seismic wavelet that is embedded within the entire seismic uh, data set. So for example, they'll take this, uh, this very averaged seismic wavelet on the left-hand side here and they'll say that is the one seismic wavelet, and they want, simply want to use a uh, deterministic deconvolution of that one wavelet. Um, so first they'll go through a debubbling step, so the, uh, the air guns generate this low frequency um, bubble that they'll remove um, using um, an exact operator, and then they won't try to improve the resolution uh, at all per se, they'll simply try to get back to zero phase by uh, generating this zero phase um, zero phasing operator, which they can involve um, with their de debubbled um, trace, and they get this um, very nice symmetric sharp wavelet at the end. Um, I've depicted at the bottom the the type of amplitude spectrum that they get. So you can see it is broad, but there are these notches in here, which uh, are generated um, typically by ghosts. Those are reflections of the of the wave field from the from the ocean surface um, tends to produce these notches in the seismic uh, spectrum, and there's a lot of work on how best to get rid of those notches in order to improve uh, resolution um, at the moment. Whether that's done with with processing or acquisition is uh, very much a subject of research right now. But at least I wanted to point out to you this this big world of differences between these two these two worlds of, of seismic exploration. The, uh, the marine side is much simpler. Um, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's not exactly true that there's only one wavelet embedded in their data sets, but they're very happy to be able to, to do that, um, that accurate uh, a method of deconvolution. And certainly on the land side, we would do it that way if we could do it that way. But the problem is that there is just a lot of variation from place to place around the survey um, that uh, <clears throat> requires us to change the deconvolution operator. So this is the way we've been doing deconvolution with a, a bit of uh, unknowns on, on, the, on the final seismic wavelet. As I say, we've never really known where there's a lot of lateral phase variation going on. It has, really hasn't been a, a big issue because, um, you know, in, in the, say 20 years ago, the oil companies were very much looking for, for elephants um, and not for really subtle things. Um, now, during the uh, shale gas explosion that at least was going on when I started my tour, um, since the uh, price of, ga uh, price of uh, oil has gone down, uh, it may in fact uh, not be an explosion at all by the time my tour ends, but I hope it's not just because of my lecture. Um, <laughs> um, certainly, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the whole shale gas explosion has been driven not so much by surface seismic um, data. Um, but much more by um, microseismic and the engineering. The engineers basically just make things happen themselves and they get these instantaneous ideas of where the fracking, the, the fractures are going, et cetera. 
um, uh, very soon afterwards. And, and they can't wait months for the land data to be processed. And even when that is processed, um, the land sur the surface data doesn't tend to be high enough resolutions um, to be useful to them. So we've certainly been getting um, the message loud and strong that the processing end of the surface data has to improve in terms of resolution. Um, and they're trying to get more and more information out of it, much like the, the fancy information that I was uh, uh, seeing that you're trying to get here in, in the labs, the, the fracturing information, the, the, the effects from Q, the azimuthal variations due to uh, stress changes in the subsurface. Uh, interpretation methods now exist for this, but there's questions as to whether we can actually process the data accurately enough. So that has led to me asking a lot of skeptical questions about whether, uh, for example, is the phase really changing laterally or not? Um, so we have these uh, politically correct statements like uh, um, that each processing shop uses, that we process our data in a controlled amplitude and phase manner. Um, but in fact, as I say, that's maybe just marketing. And uh, I'm wondering whether that's actually true. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough processing land data, especially when it starts out looking like this, because we do record mostly noise. So as I mentioned earlier, these hyperbolic reflections is what we primarily use for, for generating the images of the subsurface. But all this noise on top of it uh, is a lot of energy that is generated by that near surface land layer. Um, and it contributes probably about 95% of the energy that we actually record and we have to try to make that go away in the processing while preserving the signal. And it's not only that, that problem, but as I mentioned, uh, from place to place, the, uh, there's a lot of variation, for example, in the source wavelet. You can even just look at the hyperbolic events in these two different shot gathers from the same 3D survey. They're nearby, but obviously um, there's a lot of uh, difference in frequency content and probably phase as well. Um, between the shots within this shot gather on the right versus the left. Uh, and in addition to the, uh, the, the highly variable signal to noise ratio between these two. So in short, we need to make these, these data sets, all of these thousands of shot gathers and receiver gathers look very similar and very in the processing, much as make it look as if they were acquired in a marine environment, which is you know, easier said than done. So we spend most of our time attenuating noise. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk more about the surface consistent processing, which is the processing that's designed for removing the effects of the near surface, um, those near surface variations due to wavelets, amplitude scaling from shot to shot, receiver to receiver, and statics are the effect of the variable velocities, especially in the, in the near surface. And then once we've done all of that, uh, we then migrate the data to its true subsurface location which um, is another fascinating subject which I won't say anything about today. I'm going to uh, focus on the surface consistent processes. And so this slide to summarize in a, in a simple way what we try to do um, with the surface consistent procedure. Um, so we primarily try to collect in the source and receiver components of each one of these equations um, the effect of the near surface on the uh, source and the receiver. Uh, we'll typically have more than just the source and receiver terms affecting the wavelet. There can be CDP consistent and offset consistent terms, um, which we solve for in order to, uh, to keep those contaminating factors out of the source and receiver terms. But you can write down each of these um, uh, effects on the wavelet, on the overall amplitude scaling, on the statics in this kind of form using either convolutions, products, or additions. And the fourth equation I've written down here is phase. It fits kind of nicely mathematically, so that's why it's typically included. But as I said earlier, nobody's been solving this equation, this last one. So we've basically been um, striking a line through there. So the procedures are, are fairly simple. We transform these equations into a linear equation kind of form by taking logarithms, Fourier transforms, et cetera, whatever is required in order to get a, a simple uh, linear equation of the form y equals ax, um, and then we go about using least squares solutions to, to turn our unknown x's into knowns, uh, 
using some uh, Gauss-Seidel or conjugate gradient type techniques. It's all pretty straightforward. It's, it's important as we go forward, though, to, to be aware that the surface consistent uh, idea is, is really just a model. There's no physical law that says the data has to conform to this model, but it, it is a model that does tend to work very well. So I point this out because, in, in, in strictly speaking, surface consistency is, is false. Um, just like all the assumptions in, in most of the processing that we do. Um, but some assumptions are a lot less false than others. And uh, so that's why we use, use them um, to, in order to move forward. Uh, so people who criticize uh, statistical decon will, for example, point out these weaknesses and these assumptions. Well, we're not, we're not denying that these exist. For example, that we're assuming that the ray paths are perfectly vertical in our statics calculations. We realize that there are directivity patterns in the, on the source and receiver side, but for interpretation, those are just second-order effects, and we really are not concerned with solving for them. Um, importantly, on the, on, in the concept for source and receiver wavelet is, is very much kind of hand-wavy in the surface-consistent model. Um, so it's not only, say, the dynamite blast and the coupling effects um, that would form the wavelet we're trying to deconvolve, it's actually also the near source and near receiver effects of, of structure that are interacting with it um, that we're trying to deconvolve. So it, it's for those earthquake seismologists who uh, know what receiver function deconvolution is, it's basically the same kind of concept for surface consistent deconvolution as for source um, um, receiver function deconvolution. So this um, I'm going to go into to more detail about justifying this surface consistency by looking at the data itself. So as you can see from these three shot gathers next to each other in a, in a seismic survey, the, uh, the wavelets themselves, even though they were all dynamite blasts at the same depth, they're actually fairly different from each other. You can see that in the amplitude spectra at the bottom for each of these. There's within each shot gather a great deal of consistency, apparently, but from shot gather to shot gather, there's a great deal of, of uh, variation. So one of the first things we need to do is, is um, attenuation of the ground roll, which I illustrated going back and forth here. That affects primarily this low frequency part of the spectrum that I have circled down at the bottom. As you can see, that's removing a lot of energy, and we're never quite sure whether um, we've done that very well. In, in fact, it's never done perfectly. So um, unfortunately, it's this low frequency roll off that strongly affects the phase. We actually derive the phase spectrum directly from the amplitude spectrum. So any error in the amplitude spectrum um, translates into an error in the phase spectrum. So notice that since we're making these errors in a surface consistent sense, then um, at least we have the hope of uh, knowing that the phase errors will also be surface consistent if they actually do exist in the data. Likewise, on the receiver side, um, even though these receivers would react very basically identically within the lab, um, once you plant them out in the ground and they interact uh, differently because of coupling variations, um, near surface effects, you can get big differences in the, in the response, as you can see from the amplitude spectra at the bottom. So let's um, go forward. Um, as you can see, I have some doubts about whether these phase variations have existed. I, um, certainly, the, uh, the way we've been processing the data for the last, well, since 1993, at least when surface consistent decon used to, started to be done um, consistently, um, we'd be assuming that the data coming out of deconvolution is zero phase. So we might do some more bandwidth enhancement using um, zero phasing methods, but the assumption is that the phase variations uh, don't exist. Um, I've always been somewhat doubtful about whether that could possibly be true. So, as I say, um, I, went, I went back and took a look at these uh, previous, this, the previous work that was done long ago, and basically trying to shed new light on these, these old techniques. Um, and uh, so instead of um, having rather poor quality plots like this one down the, the lower bottom, I'm actually going to try to prove to you that we can um, measure seismic phase. Um, in actual fact, the method that we end up using was very close to this one of Downey's back in 1988. 
Um, and perhaps he just wasn't able to produce nice 3D color maps like I'm going to show you here in the future. So um, the basic, one of the basic things we chose to do was use the stack power maximization method. That's a method uh, introduced by uh, Shuki Ronan and John Clairbout um, many years ago in 1984. Um, it's a method that is particularly uh, um, known for being less sensitive to noise. So it's all the cross correlations that are taking place are actually between stack are always being done on stack data, and stacking is our is often our greatest friend in the seismic processing for noise attenuation. So they had actually tried to use that method for phase estimation, but they had tried to solve for a frequency dependent phase variation, and they had apparently failed. So um, one simplifying assumption that we decided to make to try to get a more robust solution was just to solve for just a single phase rotation for each shot and receiver in order to uh, see if that would work. And it's just the residual phase estimation that we're trying to solve for. It's, uh, we're not trying to get back to zero phase with this operation, but we're just trying to detect whether there are these lateral phase variation errors still existing in the data uh, from shot to shot and receiver to receiver. And importantly, it's, it's important to solve for both statics and phase at the same time in this procedure. So this pair of slides here will illustrate uh, with a simple synthetic example how the, the algorithm um, is, is working. So we have a couple of reflections here on this stack uh, pinching out at the right-hand side. This gather uh, indicated up in, up in here is the... Uh, the, the set of traces that would be stacked together to generate each one of these stack traces um, in the central part of the image. So we're trying to simulate what's happening, what might exist after surface consistent deconvolution. So there's supposedly this jitter that is still in the data due to velocity variations in the near surface. But if you squint closely, there's also phase variations in these wavelets. So some of these wavelets are front end loaded, some back end loaded, and that would be caused by these errors due to noise on the deconvolution. So we put this data into this simultaneous surface consistent statics and phase estimation and come up with this result here. So I'll just switch back and forth. So you can see from the, the gather up in the upper right hand corner that the wavelets not only have the jitter removed, the statics removed, but also the phase as well. And What's driving this algorithm is the, uh, the stack power, so the amplitude of these events is obviously higher afterwards compared to before. So that's what the, the engine that's actually driving the algorithm. So as a simple synthetic example, so what about, um, what about some real data now? So I'll start by illustrating kind of the, the, poster, the poster child example of surface consistent processing that we do all the time, every day in our seismic processing. We did this residual statics after deconvolution. So this is an illustration of the stack going in and after, in and after. So it's not, um, it's not a super big difference in the, uh, the quality of the image, as you can see, but it's uh, definitely an important one for sharpening up the resolution, um, for lining up these events so that they uh, have a more consistent wavelet and lead to a, a higher a higher resolution image in the end. This I've used the stack power method for, for this, and as you can see, the, the amplitude of the stack power is is been increased by 2.3%. So now we have this phase correction algorithm. So what would happen? What would a, what would surface consistent phase corrections look like if we solve for them and and, we, and apply them? And this is this is the answer. So be, so before and after before and after. So in actual fact, it looks just like a statics correction. Um, and so, um, of course, what's, what's happening is that we could, we could improve, make much the same improvement in the image using either phase variations or static corrections. Um, so, or else we could solve for both at once. So this is the, this is the both the simultaneous static and phase correction showing and it actually generates the highest stack power of all. Um, this, it actually produces the best answer overall. So how do we know what's really happening? I mean, the, the, the bottom line is you can make the data look good any of these different ways. Um, and, but just because it looks good, how do you know it is good? Um, 
So just to, to illustrate what was going on in this last set of slides with the real data, um, I've gone back to the synthetic example. So once again, we have uh, data coming out of surface consistent decon with both statics and phase variations. And because we haven't been able to solve for phase variations, we've just been going into residual statics correction. And the purpose of that is to produce coherent images like in the top right hand corner. And as you can see, it does succeed in doing that. Um, it lines up peaks with peaks, troughs with troughs, and you get a nice coherent answer that we wanted out. But just as equally, we could have, if we'd had the ability, been able to just twist the phase on these wavelets and produce an equally good result. Or, now that we have the, the, uh, the ability, um, you can get the best example, at least for this synthetic example, um, and correct for both statics and phase. So perhaps that has actually um, been what we needed to do in our data all along. Um, so when I've shown this slide before, people have typically pointed out that they're having trouble seeing what the big difference is and what the big improvement is. And that's actually um, that's part of the point of this, of this slide. Um, the, you can actually produce equally good results by doing just phase or just statics variations. And even if you do both statics and phase together, it is, does produce a slightly better result, but it's not overwhelmingly better. It's a, it's a moderate improvement. It's an important improvement, um, but not anything to, to kind of knock your socks off. And I think it's important for, to show this to people um, in order to let them realize that these, these phase variations that we've been stating have not been existing so often in the data could well have existed in our data all along um, and not really known that, they've, that it's really existed. So as I say, just because it looks right um, doesn't mean that it is right. And we should really look more critically at these uh, data, data examples in order to determine whether these uh, data really require both statics and phase corrections. So um, first I'm going to start with this additional real data example. It's a, an example from northeastern Alberta and heavy oil areas. So the, the, the actual zone of interest, um, if I can get the, uh, the button going here, is um, near the shallow section up in here above this strong unconformity, the, the Devonian. So this is the McMurray bitumen sands um, located right up in here and I've zoomed in on that. Um, so this would be a typical um, final stack section that we produce after all noise attenuation, residual statics, etc. So if we run this additional statics and phase estimation, we get this extra little tweak in the final image. Um, again, it's not anything earth shattering, but it is definitely an improvement and um, something that's worth doing. As I've indicated in this slide, the phase variations that we've ended up finding on the source and receiver side is on the order of plus or minus 35 degrees. Um, and that's the full range of the, of the phase areas. Like most of the phase uh, is within, say, plus or minus 50 degrees. So that's pretty small, um, but it's also pretty good. I mean, what we've been assuming about deconvolution uh, working perfectly is actually not that far off um, um, all along. Um, you might still be skeptical about whether noise is affecting our calculations. So you can look at the pre-stack gathers, uh, four CDP gathers here before and after. And as you can see, um, there's small little improvements in the continuity of those, those events. And it's, um, it's definitely not noise that's being lined up. It's the reflections themselves that are being lined up slightly better um, after compared to before. And these subtle little um, events in here are definitely um, more visible, more aligned after than before. Um, I plotted the actual phase and statics for each of these traces uh, that the algorithm found at the top. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see that the, the phase and the static are actually anti-correlated. So where one goes up, the other goes down. Um, this is something that we regularly see coming out of the algorithm. It's not something that we force to happen. Uh, and so it's something that requires some explanation, which I'll, I'll get to later. Um, so one of the reasons for wanting to do this, to improve this data, this, this slight amount, is to improve things like the uh, analysis of amplitudes for, say, things like Q or amplitude variation with offset that indicates changes in porosity or permeability. Uh, we even look at the data azimuthally to, to detect 
uh, changes in stress. So one of the most basic things we'll derive is uh, is the so-called intercepting gradient stacks out of the, uh, the fit of a straight line to the amplitudes as a function of, of emergence angle. And so this is the, the intercepting gradient stacks before and after this additional phase correction, phase and static correction. So again, um, a relatively small minor improvement, but it is definitely an improvement. And you can see that the consistency of the wavelets is improved especially on the gradient side, since it tends to be a little bit more sensitive to noise. Um, so that's, um, I think, already some pretty compelling evidence that the phase corrections are, are real. It's not just noise that we're measuring and lining up. Um, but I'll use this final example from Ohio, um, an unconventional play over the uh, Utica Shales. The survey is called Firestone 3D. In this particular 3D, um, like is often the case, they used multiple source types. So in this map um, along the red lines, they had these vibrosized trucks along the, uh, the farm roads. Um, and for some reason or other in the north end, they switched to using a, a nonlinear sweep. So it's just a different shape of the, of the function being, going, being put into the ground. And in between all the roads, they uh, were able to use dynamite. Uh, so in, in kid by blue is, is dynamite. So three very different source types being uh, input into the ground. And uh, in the next slide, I'll show you um, an inline section through this white line through the north. So we're going across a section where there's nonlinear vibe and dynamite. So this is a, a portion of that, size, that final section. Um, it looks like pretty darn good seismic data. In fact, the processors were very happy with it. Interpreters were happy. Um, you can have independent QC people looking at the data. They were unable to see um, any issues with the data. But then we put it into this um, statics and phase estimation algorithm and found, in fact, that um, um, there were some big phase errors remaining in the data according to this algorithm. So um, if I flip back and forth, you can actually see a fair amount of, of change. So again, if you're not familiar with seismic interpretation, you might not be impressed. But when you're trying to get these subtleties out of the data, these kind of changes are big. Um, the, the, uh, the phase curve, um, which are labeled as source phase, um, indicates that there are some, some big phase changes uh, greater than 90 degrees happening. And it's basically jumping up here whenever the, uh, the uh, near offset trace in the stack changes from being vibrosized to dynamite and back. So it's, it's, it's finding that there is some big differences in phase between these different source types. Um, this should not have existed in the data. In fact, the in steps were taken in the processing to try to remove this using some standard techniques, but they'd obviously not done a very good job. And unfortunately, um, as I say, this, these phase variations can be a snake in the grass. Um, they were completely unaware that these phase errors uh, existed until this algorithm was used. Um, notice that the receiver variations are much smaller, as, as I plotted there. So they're more the typical plus or minus 30 degree kind of variations. When you plot up the 3D maps of the phase that was found for the source types and compare it to that original map of source type, you can see that there's a, a great deal of correlation. Um, so we've got yellow lines here along the linear vibe um, um, lines on the right. It switches to dark blue in the north, where there's nonlinear vibe in the north. And in between, in the dynamite, we've got this mixture of yellow and green. And when we um, separate out the different source types individually, um, we see, again, this spatially for each source type, there's this characteristic plus or minus 35 degree variation, which we tend to see often. But there's big differences on average between each of these source types of greater than uh, greater than 90 degrees in, in some instances. So that's what generated those, those bigger errors um, as indicated by the previous slide. So the, re the receiver side, even though the, the variations were small, they were definitely very interesting. Um, we always, as I say, get this anti-correlation between phase and statics. So the, uh, the statics map is uh, opposite color compared to the phase. So where we've got blue on the left, we've got green, or red on the, on the right, and vice versa. Um, but these, uh, these 
there's other patterns um, uh, in in the in the solution immediately made us think that perhaps the topography is having some effect. So we uh, plotted up the um, the elevation map over this survey, and as you can see, um, there is a strong correlation between elevation and receiver phase that still existed in the data. So this was uh, satisfying in a way, even though these numbers were very small on the receiver side. Um, they were definitely this correlation is telling us that there is a statistical significance about those phase variations. It's, uh, so it's good for that, that it's confirming the algorithm's working. It's, again, kind of disappointing to know that you know, our assumption that phase is zero coming out of DECON is obviously not exactly right. Um, these are not big errors. They don't have a huge impact on, on, the, uh, on the normal um, everyday type of interpretation, but if you really want to extract details in the data, you, we should be trying to do better than this. So at least this algorithm is, is telling us um, that we need to do things a bit better than we have been. Um, so finally, this anti-correlation business between statics and phase. So if we plot up uh, the phase and statics for um, all the sources and all the receivers, as I say, we typically get this uh, negative correlation. Um, lot, the points line up along a line of negative slope. And this is explained uh, fairly simply, I think. So if we uh, consider these contour maps, so suppose this is the contour map of stack power for one individual shot, for example. And the perfect ideal example uh, answer is um, at the peak, so uh, so maximum um, stack power here. But actually, out of decon, we uh, actually have a phase error um, and a static error. Is, so we're at, actually at this green dot. So typically, in processing, we'd assume there is no phase error, so we just solve for statics. And so we move the data along this horizontal line until we reach this local maximum. Um, of stack power, and we say, okay, that's our correct static correction. So if the true answer is this zero phase wavelet at the peak of the contour, what we've really done is move this um, phase and static, uh, this, this wavelet with phase and static error um, down with this static in order to line up this peak with this peak back here. But then we finally come along with the new statics and phase algorithm and actually find that we can get a better solution by not only uh, backing out that initial phase uh, static static correction, but phase rotating at the same time. And so if you uh, phase rotate one way, you have to static shift up, and they're always anti-correlated. And that's the origin of this this anti-correlation. And you can actually see that if you if you track the phase going through the, the processing flow. So if you look at the shots after decon, for example, there'll be no correlation between statics and phase in general. There'll be this this cloud of results here, but then you put it into, you put it through the residual statics program, and you, sm you, you know, smear or you smush that cloud together into this this line, which we then detect with our statics and phase correction. So that's what we regularly observe after residual statics, and I think it's a it's a good argument in favor of the fact that these phase errors are real and they actually do exist in the data. Um, so I started out by describing this heated debate about phase, um, and uh, I was certainly expecting to get some pushback when I started to say that you, know, you actually can measure phase reliably. It's not just it's just not just noise that's influencing our phase calculations. So that's why I've gone through my homework here and, and presented all these arguments for why um, I believe these phase variations um, are real and can be measured. Um, I'm not saying that the phase problem has been solved, not even close to that. Uh, there can still be long wavelength phase variations in the data, as I state at the bottom here. So just like uh, after every surface consistent process, there can be long wavelength static and phase variations that are invisible to these algorithms because our, our receiver arrays are basically too, uh, too narrow in order to uh, detect those kind of variations. Um, but at least I'm confident that uh, um, this conclusion can be made that the surface consistent phase can be reliably measured. And so perhaps those uh, old techniques were doing something right and we just weren't completely aware of it. Um, and importantly, I think you might not be terribly impressed by this improvement in the images, but that's been a 
I think that's important as well to, to realize both that the decon has been working relatively well, um, and that if we do tune up the processing a bit with these phase corrections, it's not going to have a huge change in the interpretation. So, you know, one of the reactions I've had is people just really don't want to hear about these phase errors that are in the data because they're afraid, you know, it's going to change their interpretation. So they've been directing their horizontal wells just fine um, without having these phase corrections. And I'm not saying that's going to change if you make these phase corrections. It's actually just going to tune things up a bit. So hopefully through all this work, we can actually get statistical deconvolution to be, be becoming more of a quantitative science. And uh, you know, hopefully the idea is to, to separate us out from the politicians, the, the Donald Rumsfelds in the world, who uh, will not uh, and will not be as, as biased as in those kind of situations. So just to, to finish, I'd like to thank Andrews Cordson personally for putting up the money for this tour. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the lecture tour committee, as well as my colleagues back at Arcus, um, for bringing me here today to talk to you instead of working. So thanks very much.